Good morning. Good morning. I'm so grateful to be here, to be with you, and thank you for the Zoe group for leading us in worship. I'm already on cloud nine, so y'all need to get up there too. We're going we're gonna to travel this journey together. I am so just in awe of this text that we're going to look through and how we're going to explore the relationship of David and Jonathan. Now, before I get into this, I have some preacher friends, and as a minister, it's not good usually to listen to some of your preacher friends. <laughs> so they went to Rabbi Wolby's session yesterday, and they were like, you know what you should do to really get under Mike's skin? You should title your lesson, Love is Love. And I said, we're not going to do that today because I want to be invited back and I want Mike to answer my calls. <laughs> and so instead, I want us to actually look at the text and see if we can wrestle together with what the writer has to teach us. So in 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter, beginning at verse 1, we hear this. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And then in 1 Samuel, the 20th chapter, we get another glimpse of the relationship of David and Jonathan, beginning at verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. That's a clear sign. <laughs> and Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David and with him a little boy. And he said to the boy, run, and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the boy, hurry, be quick, do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master, but the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter, and Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, Go and carry them to the city. As soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. And then in 2 Samuel, the first chapter, beginning at verse 26. At the end of Jonathan's life, he is now dead, and David is lamenting. And David says these words, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. So to say that their relationship is awkward is a kind of an understatement. To say that their relationship is unique just doesn't quite hit it. But as I was going through this text, I did what I had been trained to do, that you start with the text, you stay in the text, and you wait for a word from the Lord. But I have to be honest that I never felt comfortable with the text. The text is hard. It's difficult, it's unique, it's strange, it's complex. And the relationship between David and Jonathan just stirred something in me. And as I was doing this, and then I began to start my exegetical process only to recognize that I wasn't exegeting the text, but I was analyzing a relationship. And the discomfort that I was feeling, 
was my own discomfort and nobody else was uncomfortable because David and Jonathan were fine. <laughs> and so was the writer of the text. So why was it that I was uncomfortable? Why was it that I was wrestling, that I was struggling? And I began to exegete my own life through the text. And what I began to realize is that what makes us uncomfortable about David and Jonathan is that we have a false sense of masculinity. See, the relationship with David and Jonathan drives us bonkers. It puts us in uncomfortable waters. It puts us in a difficult predicament, mainly because we see David and Jonathan and we don't believe that men should act that way. We have this fear that if men get emotional, they get too close, they become too connected, that something is wrong with them and they must be not what they're supposed to be. And see, I had to deep, dig down deep and to realize that I didn't know what it meant to be actually to be a man. Yes, I was born male and yes, I had seen signs, but the way that I had been taught to define masculinity was to actually to do everything that femininity told me was wrong. So we look at manhood and we say, how do you become a good man? Well, those things are feminine, and so don't do that. Is that truly the way we define masculinity in our world? Is that a healthy way of seeing being a man of God? Because, see, if you look at David's life, David lives in a life where there's about three different episodes to his life. There's the pre-time before he's in the house of Saul, and then his relationship with Jonathan, and then after Jonathan. And David is actually his best self, his healthiest self, his most humble self, while Jonathan is his best friend. It's after Jonathan's death that David's monster, the evil inside of him, the darkness that is constantly near him begins to erupt and play out. There is no Bathsheba if there's a Jonathan. There is no pulling Michael back if there's a Jonathan. The reason that David is distressed and oppressed and he can't seem to find himself is because what he needs is his Jonathan. He needs the other wholeness of his masculinity. But see, we find ourselves in conflict because we're actually more comfortable with David the monster, David the rapist, and David the adulterer than we are with David the psalmist. Because we've been taught that masculinity is actually more about dominating femininity. And so we see David and Jonathan in this dance that's beautiful and complex, and it makes us uncomfortable because that's not what we've been taught to be as good men. But see, David was a great husband until Jonathan was gone. David was a great friend and his humility rose and he was a great king. But after Jonathan, David is in despair and chaos runs his house. Because David has no one to be fully transparent with. David is a shell of himself because his fullness was found in his relationship with someone who understood him. And so I don't believe that David and Jonathan's relationship has to be sexual, even has to be on the spectrum of even homoerotic. I believe that instead it's our discomfort that places them in that predicament, that places it in that view because we're uncomfortable with real masculinity or we don't even know what it is. See, we've begun to see that I'm a little bit more comfortable with David acting in negative unhealthy behavior because at least that's what it means to be a man. Are we really okay with that? Is that really how we function as men? See, David has a softer side, a more emotional side, and it's because of Jonathan that he's able to express it. See, their very first interaction, their souls are knit together, and Jonathan gives David of himself. He takes off his belt, his robe. He even gives him his sword and his bow, and he says to him that he loves him. And it's this friendship, it's this kindred spirit that they share where they're fully transparent, fully open, fully able to embrace one another that allows David to be a healthy king. And somewhere along the way, we looked at the relationship, and maybe you did just as I did, and it did something to me. About five years ago, when I was starting out in my ministry career in Atlanta, I had just, finished, uh, I had just graduated from Emory doing my MDiv, and I was asked to be a part of a group, a very special group. And some of the men in that group are here with me today, and I'm so grateful for them. 
Uh, and what we called our group was preacher camp. So it's a bunch of preachers. We get together once a year. We live all over the country, but we get together once a year basically to take care of one another. We pray with one another. We tell our stories to one another and our relationship spans beyond our once a year get together, but instead we keep up with one another. We hold each other accountable. We hold each other in love. We are fully transparent. We're fully known and fully loved by one another. And as a minister, I had no idea how important this group would be to me. These men are my Jonathan. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it can be a lonely place. Because as a minister, yes, you're part of the congregation, but you're never fully in the congregation. The congregation holds you at a distance. They hold you in this place of, yes, you're part of us, but you can't fully be with us because we need to disconnect from you. And I understand. And so David, as king, as he's walking this journey, as God has called him, he's on a lonely road of isolation and despair. And so David's trying to figure out how to navigate a new world when he doesn't have a road map to get to the destination. And Jonathan befriends him and Jonathan shows him love and kindness, even at Jonathan's own apparel, because Jonathan is actually the rightful heir to the throne. And Jonathan sacrifices self for the very sake of David and for the will of God to be made manifest. Not to take advantage of David, not to coerce David, not to manipulate David, but because he saw that David needed some guidance. He needed to be loved well. And I recognize that I, too, needed to be loved well. And yes, I've been married for eight years, about to be nine, and I love my wife dearly. I would never ask for another. She is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. But there are some things that even my wife just can't understand. And it's not because she doesn't try. It's not because she doesn't have the academic IQ to do so. Instead, it's just because as a man, there are certain things that only other men understand. But see, we've been taught to put on a facade that men don't cry, that you suck it up, that you pull yourself up, that you don't show weakness, because that's not what men do. And so what we create by telling young boys who develop into men these things, we create these rage monsters who have no emotional outlet, who are mentally scarred, who are emotionally broken. And then we tell them that you should go off and be with somebody else to have a good relationship. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, look at the text. The reason that David struggles in every female relationship is because David is a broken man who doesn't have accountability and have true love from somebody who knows better. So he's trying to navigate a circumstance for which he has no understanding of. And so David picks one woman and the next woman and the next woman and he steals women and he takes advantage of women and he's manipulative. David looks like a mob boss toward the end of his life. The story of David looks a lot more like the Godfather than the crucifixion. But oh, when there was a Jonathan, David was a lot different. And so, yes, I tell you that these men who I get together with once a year are my Jonathan, but how many of us actually need a Jonathan? Would we be better husbands, better fathers, better friends, better ministers if we had a Jonathan? If as men we had someone that we could call our best to and that called the best out of us, that walked with us through our darkest moments, that kept the evil that was so close to us, so tangible within us at bay. Would it make a difference? And see, that was where I thought God was stopping. But oh, God had another plan. Because see, it wasn't about just do I need a Jonathan, but am I willing to be a Jonathan? See, in our churches, as we look at what some would say is despair and decline, I believe that we need to restore a true identity of what masculinity is. Amen. That we frame masculinity in very unhealthy and harmful and dangerous ways. And the way that we've done so is by oppressing our women. We've done so because we believe that the only way to be a man is to dominate something. When the Bible tells us that that's not the way it is. And if I, as a young minister, a young man, don't take other men under my wing and I don't communicate with them and I don't congregate with them and I don't fellowship with them to teach them that you don't have to blow up and blow out to be a man. 
Being a man is not about how many women you have or how much status you can acquire or how much power you can dominate with. It's not about those things. It's not about if you don't cry tears or showing no emotion or just pretending that nothing ever bothers you. So you keep stuffing things down deeper and deeper only to finally burst because there's nowhere else to place the hurt. But see, I've watched men and I was one of those. Because I didn't know that I could do anything with what I felt. I didn't even know I was supposed to feel. The world told me that you just don't do that. But see, once I had a relationship with these group of men who showed me that it was okay to be my full self, I had to learn a language. I had to learn to communicate that which I was taught was not to be explored. And see, as a 32-year-old man now, it wasn't up until about four or five years ago that I actually learned to communicate my feelings. And as bad as that might sound, there are some of you who are older than me who've never done it either. And what's really disappointing is that some of those men are actually in leadership in our churches. We've placed really unhealthy, broken, dangerous men in positions to guide God's people and to lead God's people to a healthy life when they themselves don't have a healthy support system. But see, we say that, oh, those things are for women. That's what women do. They just cry it out. They're emotional. We're, you know, we're not the emotional kind. But then I look at it and see that the reason I'm so uncomfortable with David and Jonathan is because what David and Jonathan have is actually what I most desire. But because of my discomfort, I teach the Bible school story of David all the time, that David is the great war hero because that's manly. Yeah, we know David was an adulterer and he killed his friend, but hey, that's what men do. But something about the David who wraps himself in sackcloth and ashes and cries before God, the David that dances before his God, the David who kisses Jonathan, mm, we don't want to talk about that. Because that makes David seem a little, hmm. But why? Why does David have to somehow have his masculinity questioned because he chooses to be healthy? Is there really something wrong with David? Or is it actually something wrong with us? Did we paint a false picture of David that looks more like the man that we wanted as opposed to the man that is? And is Jonathan more of a help to David as opposed to a burden that we just can't seem to wrap our minds around? So what I've tried to do as I've walked through this text, as I've analyzed this text, as I've seen this relationship, I find myself going back to their first encounter in 1 Samuel 18, 1 and 4. And I want you to see this now through the necessity that David is about to journey on. In 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. He removed David from all community. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan sees David in a dark moment and he recognizes that this could only get worse. My father has pulled this man from his family and has told him that he will now reside in this space where he is a foreigner, where he is a stranger. And Jonathan says, I refuse to let that happen. I refuse to let this man do life alone. I refuse to allow David to journey through the brokenness of this world without some help. But instead, he decides to bind himself to a man who's trying to figure himself out. 
and together they wrestle through life. Together, Jonathan helps David calm the rage monster that is within him. The evil that is so pressing upon David is somehow held at arm's length when Jonathan is around. But oh, we need more Jonathans. Our church needs more Jonathans. More of our young men and even our older men need more Jonathans. But God saw us just as David, and he gave us all a Jonathan. The Jonathan that gave his life for the sake of his friends. See, the story of David and Jonathan is nothing more than a small glimpse into the life of Christ. The Christ that binds himself to us even in our darkest moments. The Christ that sees us in all of our brokenness and chooses to stick with us. The Christ, the spirit that lives within us, that dwells within us to help us keep our sinful, deathly nature at arm's length. But see, we don't see anything wrong with Christ doing what he did for us, but we find ourselves this uncomfortable about David and Jonathan. And the reason being is because somehow we put Jesus in a category that's supernatural, and we put David in the category that has to be the man of the hour. And so God can do what men aren't supposed to do. And somehow men shouldn't act like that. And Jesus, well, he's God, so he gets a pass. But he wrapped himself in flesh. He walked in the clothing of man. And he also had some really close friends. I don't know about you, but the Bible tells me he did life with 12 really cool guys. And three of them he was a little bit closer to than the rest. And if you don't think that they ever spent time and that Jesus called them to account for their darkness, well, then you haven't read the Gospel of John where Jesus reengages Peter after he denies him. See, the relationship between Jesus and his disciples is the same relationship that David and Jonathan share. It's a relationship of helping men to find healthy masculinity. And every time that the masculine narrative comes out of reach, Jesus has to remind his disciples that that's not what Christian men act like. Peter, it's okay to put down the sword. It's okay to wash one another's feet. It's okay to be a little bit more sensitive and a little bit more humble. I just hope that David and Jonathan's story doesn't get couched in some bad narrative when it's really helpful. So what I would ask us to do this morning, what I would call us to do this morning is to take a deeper look at David and Jonathan, especially how Jonathan behaves with David. And then to ask ourselves, can we be a Jonathan to someone? And here's why I'm saying this. So I did my undergrad at ACU, and part of my time in Abilene, I worked, well, I shouldn't say I worked, I served in Big Brothers Big Sisters, and I had a little brother. And my little brother, uh, he was in third grade at the time, but he was what they deemed a high-risk child. Now, he's in the third grade. I don't know what high-risk means in third grade, but somehow they had defined that he was at high risk. I don't know what a risk was, but hey, he was dang that. And the teacher said, well, he just, can't pay attention, he can't learn, he's very, he acts out, and he does all these things. And so the first time I met my little brother for lunch, I asked him to tell me about himself, and he told me about his mom. And he just went on and on about his mom, and after he kind of took a pause, I said, well, tell me about your dad. He said, I don't have one. And I said, well, then tell me about any other you know, father figure or man that you have in your life. He said, I don't have one. And so what I began to realize is that this young third grader was not a monster. He needed a Jonathan. He needed somebody to walk the journey of life with him and to help him to learn what it meant to be a man. Because in the third grade, he understood that being a male and being male meant to act out, to misbehave, to dominate and to pick on girls and to fight all day long. That's what he internalized. That's what he saw. And so my job was to show him a different picture. 
My job was to show him that that was an accurate photo. That vision of masculinity was detrimental and harmful and it wasn't productive. But at the time, I didn't see my role as any big deal. Just as I don't think Jonathan sees his role with David as a big deal. But the Bible tells us that it was a crucial experience for David. Because David is vastly different with Jonathan. And the men of our church, the men of this world will be vastly different if we decide to be better Jonathans to one another. And so I ask that we do so. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, there is nothing we can say, Father, that will give you the glory that you deserve. Father, beyond our imagination, you saw us in our weakest moments, our darkest days. And Father, you came near to us. And Father, You stripped yourself of everything. Like Jonathan, you took off your robe. You gave up your place on the throne. And you embraced us as your children, as your friends. And so, Father, we ask that we will model that life. A life that helps us to redefine what it means to be a man and mostly what it means to be a man of yours through the eyes of the cross that Jesus bore. Father, help us as men to be better husbands, better fathers, better friends. And Father, help our wives and the women in our lives to challenge us to do just that. That, Father, we never become comfortable with men misbehaving and being unhealthy for the sake of saying that that's just what men do. But instead, Father, we look to the greatest man who ever lived, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, it's in his name that I pray. Amen.